you here. Good. Thank you. Thank you for making the trip into Telluride tonight. If you did travel, we know the weather turned bad, but in our eyes, when you get moisture, you're in a good spot. So this is a great way to kick off tonight. Thank you for being here. I am Jason Corzine with the Telluride Foundation, and I am honored to have each and every one of you here tonight, a packed house on a very important topic and one that is near and dear to our organization, mainly because our goal is to foster conversation about the region's most important topics and issues and then bring experts to the table to help foster that conversation. So I want to, first of all, thank the Colorado Water Trust for helping us pull this event together tonight and our panelists who drove from all over the state to be part of this, thank you. Quick recognition of April Montgomery, found what I consider the foundation's water expert, just so you know. <laughs> she told me not to say that, but I do. <laughs> Courtney Groves in the back who helped pull this together. So that's our staff, and again, we are very grateful that you made the trip and you're here. As the community foundation serving this region, our goal is to make sure we honor what is most important, and that is the agricultural base that makes this community thrive and the natural resource they thrive on. We have no agenda tonight. Our agenda is to have a dialogue, to talk about innovation, to hear from ranchers and water experts from around the state who are doing innovative things to move the needle on water resource conservation while protecting a quality and way of life in the agricultural base. So we will have Q&A, we'll have dialogue after tonight. But again, let's respect the ideas and the ideologies that come out of this because we are all driving for the same thing. And that is to protect a way of life, to protect our agricultural land base, and more importantly, to protect the water it thrives on. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kate, and the rest is yours. Kate. Well, thank you so much for turning out tonight. My name is Kate Ryan. I'm the executive director of the Colorado Water Trust. I, I'm actually really just a water attorney. I've been ED of the Water Trust for just a few months now. It is an organization that is so near and dear to my heart because of the work that we do, I deeply believe in it. Um, we, our mission is to restore flows to Colorado rivers. And we are an NGO, but we're not an advocacy organization. We just work on projects. So we work on water rate acquisitions, and we work together with water rate owners to help them use their water rights for environmental purposes when they want to do so. So we take donations, we do leases, we work with agricultural producers to use their water for environmental purposes when it has a benefit to local rivers and when it also has a benefit to them and to their operations. We've been doing it for 22 years. Um, prior to that, I was an attorney in private practice and I did that for some of my private clients, whether they were landowners, municipalities, any kind of water user, and it works for them, and I think it works really well for the environment as well. So I'm really proud to be a part of this work. Um, I also want to introduce, while we're here, some of our staff who've come, uh, Danielle and Blake are coming down from Ignacio and Durango. Really happy to have you here. And Dana Hutley, thank you for being here too. So we have staff all over the state, but we're a pretty small organization. Um, and we do work all over the state as well. Um, one of the things that we do clearly is our aim is to, when it has an environmental purpose or benefit, we like to keep water in rivers. And so tonight's panel, of course, is about agriculture. And agriculture does not necessarily keep water in rivers, but there is a real, very strong and important connection between agriculture and the water in our rivers. So agriculture, it takes water out of rivers and uses that water to support growing crops. We all need to eat. It's beautiful food. It keeps our areas beautiful. It also supports wildlife, migratory birds, sandhill cranes come to mind. Water used for agriculture also prevents fires. 
it keeps our lands from becoming completely dry. We don't want to have all the water in rivers. They would be just channelized rivers. It wouldn't be the Colorado that we know and love. And another thing that happens when you put water on an agric agricultural property, some of that water is delayed in its return to streams. And so that keeps our streams running longer into the fall months and late summer months. So this, ty this time of year is when we're kicking some of our projects at the Water Trust into, into, uh, into action, I guess you'd say. Um, a good example, we just got an agreement that was approved by the Colorado River District with some agricultural producers in Grand County, Colorado. They have stopped some irrigation on their property early this year. And it was really important to be able to kick that into gear all of a sudden because we've got this beautiful wet season. We had an amazing snowpack, but then the rivers in the upper Colorado and the Fraser just dried up. And so we're able to work with them to provide compensation to use their water for a few weeks at a time when their rivers would otherwise be very dry. They were able to engage in agricultural production earlier this season, and then we provide them compensation for the use of their water rights over these few weeks, which keeps the Fraser River running. So it's really important for the environment, and it provides some compensation for them as well that they're turning around and using for upgrades to their system. So that's the type of work we do, and we couldn't do it without agricultural producers. In the environment in Colorado, we've only had environmental water rights since the 1970s, which compared to other water rights in our state is really, really recent. So we're new to the table, and we need to partner with agricultural producers, and we really appreciate our relationships with them. So I'm pretty pleased to be having a conversation with you tonight about what you do. So tonight's conversation is not about environment and rivers. It's really about water, drought, and agricultural production. So I'm going to ask some questions of the panelists, but it will just be really interesting to see where the conversation goes. Look forward to it. Um, tonight we have Marsha Dogenbaugh, who is a multi-generation rancher from the Elk River near Steamboat Springs. Sajin Folsom from Norwood, local to San Miguel. Kathleen Curry from the Gunnison area, Tamichi Creek, who's also a project partner, and Rob Lindner from Pagosa Springs, who uses water from the Piedra system of rivers. At any rate, pretty excited to kick it off. Oh, and I do have to mention, of course, because we're here, we are a nonprofit, um, you do have a brochure, a little takeaway, and if you're able to look at it at some point in the future, don't need to do it tonight, we do have more information on the Colorado Water Trust and ways you can get involved with our organization. We love people to get involved with us on every single level, where it's just finding out what we do, finding out about our projects, and thinking about if you want to partner with us, or becoming a supporter of the Water Trust. It's essential to our work. But let's kick it off for tonight. Um, and as I ask the questions, if you want to talk a little bit more about yourself as well and what you do as an agricultural producer and where your background, please feel free. Um, Sage, and let's, let's start with you. And then if, if everybody wants to take a stab at all the questions, that would be great. Um, so one thing, our panel tonight is water, drought, and the future of agriculture. And I think that probably most lay people, if they're not water professionals or agricultural professionals, when they think about water and they think about drought, they probably think about con conservation. And so my first question, if you don't mind kicking it off, is do you as an ag producer engage in conservation? And if you do, is there any particular method of water conservation that you practice for your operations? Thank you, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, my name is Sage Folsom. I'm pretty new to this area relatively. Um, I've been here for 13 years, been producing for 12. Uh, I have a cow-calf operation in Norwood um, and I came out here to help my aunt out. Um, I'm fr originally from Northern California from a really small town and as you know, they are really struggling with water right now. Um, so it's interesting to see what they are dealing with and seeing that 
start to trend that way here at times. Um, conservation, first off, I'd like to say I think conservation is a word that we need to define because oftentimes conservation is used as a way of a hidden agenda there of reallocation of water away from producers and farmers to cities and that's something that I'm not for. Um, I don't think we need to be sending more water down our rivers just to feed cities um, and more urban growth. So that's not what I'm here for and that's not what I'm here to talk about. For me, conservation is how do we use water intelligently? How do we produce more with the amount of water we have or with less water? And there are practices that can move in that direction and I am trying to implement them on my farm. Um, for the past few years, I've been doing uh, no-till farming. So we've been um, trying to get our pastures back into better condition by doing no-till farming. No-till farming is a form of, far of farming that you don't um, disturb the soil as much and therefore you're leaving a lot of the uh, organic matter on top and that organic matter holds water in the soil and holds biology in the soil and that can hold water in the soil and uh, it's been starting to be used as pretty popular um, among uh, people growing annual crops so there's some people uh, some good friends of mine up in Grand Junction that have moved they they have a large amount of farmland that they're doing up there 900 acres of farming um, Philip and uh, Lowell Keen I think Philip's last, I can't think of Philip's last name, but Lil Keen, um, they've been doing no-till farming up there, and they've seen their water um, usage cut by about 30 to 40 percent year after year. Um, so they're using significantly less water and raising the same amount of crops, which is really a great thing to see. Um, so I've been doing that. I've got swales on my farm, on my ranch, that hold water, um, stop the runoff during snow melt and large rain events and can put the water down deeper um, trying to keep pastures from being overgrazed so keeping some uh, organic matter on top of the soil planting um, diverse crops so that we have a lot of diversity in our fields and planting windbreaks um, i'm kind of in the beginning stages of trying to get my ranch in place so i'm spending a lot of time on infrastructure right now so i'm not near where I want to be, but I'm getting there. Um, so those are some of the things that I'm trying to do to use my water more efficiently. Okay, thanks for coming this evening. My name is Marcia Dockenbaum, and uh, I am third generation in the Lower Oak River Valley. The Oak River feeds into the Yampa, which feeds into the Green, which then feeds into the Colorado. So we feel like we have a very vested interest in protecting some of the water issues that we have. Um, my career spans not only from being very active with the ranch operation, which is a cattle and hay operation, but I also worked for the USDA Farm Service Agency for 25 and a half years. And then I became the executive director for a nonprofit in Route County called Community Agriculture Alliance. And the main purpose of that was to make sure that we, people were educated about how important agriculture is to the culture, to the economy, to the general well-being of the Yampa Valley. Our ranch has done a lot of the same things that Sajan has talked about over the years. We put in a lot of ponds and reservoirs to help hold the water, all of them legal, I might add. <laughs> Um, we do have irrigation rights that date back to the 1880s out of the Elk River, and we share those with uh, three other neighbors on our ditch. So we are fortunate that we don't have a huge amount of people that we have to deal with. Um, we have done the, the wetland mitigation. We've done the fire mitigation. We have... Um, we've. We've worked with NRCS over the years. We've worked with other groups that are trying to help us help ourselves. Um, but I think maybe the biggest conservation effort that we utilize on our ranch, and we now have three generations still working this ranch together, 
is that it's our awareness. We constantly are monitoring what the conditions are and what we think is going to happen next. Sometimes we're right, a lot of times we're wrong. But the history that we've had over the years and then looking at the new technology and how can we make things, we don't want to do any harm. We want to make sure we are doing the right thing and we're doing it correctly when the day is done. So I'm going to give credit to some of the old timers for what they've done through the years, but then lending to some of the new technology that is coming through that's helping us conserve water on our place. Uh, I'm Kathleen Curry, and as Kate mentioned, I'm from the Upper Gunnison Basin, and our family has a cow-calf operation east of Gunnison, and uh, we uh, raise native grass hay, and we flood irrigate. So the, I think one of the points I need to get across right off the bat is that agriculture is different everywhere you go. And um, I actually was stumped by this question because I never thought about us um, consciously trying to conserve. We just use what we get. Uh, we're at about 8,500 feet, and so we're pretty high up in the system. And if it's a dry year, then we're going to have less yield on some of the hay crop, and um, we'll have less to sell. And, and most of it we feed, but we do sell what, what's extra. Um, so in terms of conservation, I think a bit more like management um, and, uh, you know, we're going to put water out when it comes. We don't have reservoirs that control the flow. We don't place an order like you would with the Uncompagra system or Grand Valley water users or some of the, the big irrigation systems where you actually have a continuous supply. That's not how it works um, for these forage crops at high elevation. And I, I, so I think uh, we just naturally try to get by with what we have. And if it's a good year, we're going to run water um, after we're done haying to try to recharge the groundwater. Uh, the late season flows are really important for the creek. We got to have fall stock water. We try to bring up some grass. We only have one cutting. So there aren't a lot of options really. Um, and we sure as heck won't be going towards um, sprinkler or irrigating from the top down because that would totally screw up a system that's uh, 140 years old. We've been, it, we've been irrigating in this pattern in this valley and it works. We recharge the groundwater, we, our return flows provide water for the next guy down. Um, and I do, so, you know, there's the San Luis Valley is pretty close to us and they went to sprinkler, as you know. Uh, but so what you might think, what some people might think of as conservation uh, wouldn't really work where we are, but other areas in the state, I think it could, because uh, I work with a lot of um, producers in the Grand Valley and in the Compagre Valley. But for us, really, um, conservation is about just managing what we have to maximize our hay crop. Kathleen and uh, good evening all. My name is Rob Lindner and as mentioned my family operates down in uh, the Pocosa Springs area. We're in the Piedra Valley which similarly flows into the San Juan and then the lower Colorado. Um, we also have access to uh, ditches and rights that were part of the original homestead and um, you know it's been a real honor to grow up in that system and it's really inspired me. I've continued to work in natural resources, um, studying wildlife biology, and, and really moving into, you know, how do we move forward as a species across landscapes in a way that really looks to our own resilience. And I think this is a key component of why we're gathering here this evening. Um, you know, in regards to how we operate, um, I would echo the same. We use observation and uh, hypothesis testing. You know, we don't assume that just because we've done things one way in the past that that's how we should continue do it, doing it. And certainly, you know, as we are aware, you know, the cycles that we're seeing from a climatic standpoint require us to be adaptable. Um, and we've also recognized that it's important to engage in partnership 
um, working with our local agencies, building relationships with our neighbors, and doing a lot of research. There's so much information out there now. Um, it's not just about your drainage. You can learn from other drainages, other watersheds that, you know, what are they trying? Perhaps that could work for us. Um, and some of the things that we've implemented over time are restoring native species, rotational grazing with our cattle. Um, we run cow-calf operations. We also have um, haying operation and we've stopped tilling. Um, we've started to respect the areas where we have natural grasses and uh, restore native species. Um, we have retention ponds. Um, those are there before us, but we've started to recognize how valuable those are. And, and we really just pay attention to the timing. You know, we recognize there's a really um, wide range of diversity across where we operate, and each one of those deserves its own consideration. There's microclimates, um, day to day, you know, the activities that we might do are very different in each location. So we've been leveraging, you know, technology like geospatial information systems and remote sensing to help us learn about the patterns that maybe aren't as easily observed from the ground um, or through time. And um, we've also learned that there are some bigger systems at play. We've done restoration thinning in our forests to reduce some of that water requirement uh, across the landscape. Um, and that creates, you know, that disturbance um, opportunity for regeneration across that area or wildlife habitat. We've done in-stream uh, restoration as well to provide holding water for uh, fish and um, we're working with Colorado Water Trust to explore what are the ways in which, you know, not only can we continue operating, um, but do it so that we can support in-stream flows um, without the risk of losing our water rights. It's a practice we've done for a long time, um, but not necessarily legally. And so, uh, you know, we try and be conservative with our water use and get our um, growth of plants and forbs started early in the season. Um, just, you know, if not earlier, by the time the high country runoff is tapering, um, slowing that flow through flood irrigation makes a big difference. And it also helps prepare, prepare our pastures for, you know, the you know, impending drier season. Um, sometimes our summer rains don't come. So if we haven't gotten that green up early on, um, then we'll always be watering. Um, so we find that observations may be one of our best conservation methods out there. Thanks. It was really great. Um, Kathleen, if you don't mind, I would like to direct the next question to you because I thought it's so interesting what you said about how you, you work with what you've got and you take the years as you come. And it, one thing I want people to know is how innovative you are as well. It's not, you're very, very proactive, which is so interesting. So for anybody who doesn't know, Kathleen has also been a three-time state representative and you are somebody who we are partnering with at the Water Trust on a project. So you are using the full extent of your water rights and fortunately for the Water Trust and for Tamichi Creek especially, we are getting to share just a little bit of the use of your water right for environmental purposes. And, and that's something I like for people to understand too is that when we use water for the environment, we are, we are literally using it under Colorado law, um, whether it's sanctioned or not. Um, but we're, we're very much using it. So my other question for you is that, you know, what are farmers and ranchers talking about when, when you're gathering now? And how has this, does the topic of water availability shape those conversations? Has it changed over the last couple decades? And I'm sorry to embarrass you just a tiny bit more, but so, you know, like conversation wise, Kathleen is also on the board of the Colorado River District and is engaged with the Gunnison Basin Roundtable, and there is so much conversation around the state. So I'm wondering if you could kick us off on that question. Sure, I'll try. Um, well, so the Gunnison County Stock Growers Association, um, we have been having a lot of meetings lately, but they haven't really been water-related, they've been wolf-related. So we have 
um, chatted because <laughs> there really isn't a coffee shop or anything that everybody goes to and that's kind of a misnomer nobody has time to do that anyway but um, so I would say that there's a lot of um, angst around the Colorado River situation um, maybe it's because I'm involved with that board but it there's there's confusion about the level of risk that we might be facing and whether or not there could be um, a scenario where we're out of compliance on the compact uh, there and it depends on who you talk to you know the state will tell you that we don't need to worry we'll be fine but everything in the Gunnison upper Gunnison is was um, three quarters of our water was adjudicated in the 40s so with a 1922 Colorado River compact if the water rights junior to 22 are vulnerable that would put our whole basin on call because our we wouldn't get our junior water and nobody can put up a hay crop but no ranch is going to make it if we can't use three quarters of our water now granted in a dry year we might not have some of those juniors anyway I get that but in the spring when there's no call on you sure as heck want to put it out and if we have to bypass it to the lower basin states that's got everybody stressed out so no one's really buying the argument that oh we don't need to worry because if we continue to see a decline in Powell and Mead um, and you know they're worried about their infrastructure down there because God forbid you know we got to have hydropower come first for Phoenix so they're worried about those lakes and and we're the ones anybody here junior to 22 is on the line and that would be all your municipal water that would be those trans mountain diversions so i so our conversations are generally oh god the creek the creek you know the creek didn't run very good this year or the creek ran really well this year and took everything out on its way down <laughs> and and then uh, and then we go more into this colorado river issue um and I, and I won't get into the wolf thing. <laughs> uh, over the last <clears throat> few years, especially during the drought, it seems like all we talked about was water. If you ran into a friend that was a rancher, <laughs> you would talk about how much water you did or didn't have, whether it rained or didn't rain. That is literally all we talk about. And uh, so, um, we're all worried about it. We all need as much water as we can to make a living doing this. Um, so I guess <clears throat> some of the things that we're talking about, people are talking about, if we were going to go back to talking about conservation, is what can we do to be more productive with that much water or less, like I was talking about earlier. And the things that seem to be catching on with ranchers and farmers are the things that can be done that doesn't uh, cut into their pay. The, you, we have, they're making a living off of this. And so it can't be expensive for them. It can't cut into their pay. And it also can't cut in their time because they're, all these ranchers are busy as it is. They don't have any more time to do extra things. Um, so the, the biggest thing that I've seen that people are talking about is in as far as conservation that seems to make sense is again going back to the no-till farming again this is more applicable for people that are raising crops than it is for perennial grassland <coughs> pastures but um, if you're doing no-till farming it's a win-win-win um, you are spending less time because you're not you're only going across once well twice you're cultivating the crop you're planting the crop into residual crop from your last crop and then you're cultivating it, but you don't have to disc it, you don't have to level it, you don't have to do all of the other things that you would normally have to do. So that makes sense for a lot of ranchers and the people that I've seen, and farmers, and the people that I've seen that have transitioned to that kind of farming, it has been incredibly beneficial and time-saving, so they've actually seen an increase in what they make, um, what goes in their bank accounts, and a decrease in the amount of time they spend in the machine and diesel costs and all that, so that makes sense for most ranchers. There's other things that we could be doing, I think, um, you know, management-wise, overgrazing is a problem that decreases topsoil, and the decrease in topsoil and organic matter means a decrease in water retention. So by using things like rotational grazing, even if that's, and, and rotational grazing is difficult because it takes a lot of infrastructure and it takes time, and that's things, again, that ranchers don't have, but if we can 
do a little better job of rotation when we're grazing our cows and managing our cows so that we're not taking all of the organic matter off the fields and leaving some and keeping more, getting more organic matter back into the soil and using other things like high density grazing or mob grazing or adaptive high intensity rotation grazing. There's all these different terms, but those kind of things in, have been used all over the West. And I just went to a conference in Georgia where there's people in North Dakota who get 11 inches of annual rainfall and they've increased their organic matter and they're raising more cows on their farm and ranch now than they were 20 years ago with less rain. That's in their pocketbook. That is affecting them. They're making more money now and raising more animals now. So those are the kind of things I think we need to think about. How do we be more efficient with our management systems and our time, but it has to pay the ranchers back. It has to pay them back in financially and it has to pay them back in their time eventually. Well, you can tell I'm the elder on this committee just because my, my kids call me Q-tip, if that helps you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'm gonna take it back even 10 years, further than 10 years. What I have really seen in perhaps even the last 20 and the last 30 years is the change in attitude with ag producers. What I used to hear was, hell no, it's my water, I'm not gonna give it up, you can't take it, I'm not gonna, and I'll fight to the, and the word was my water. It wasn't my water rights, it wasn't my, my opportunity to use it. But I see our conversations have shifted greatly, partly because of all of our round table work and all the, the joint collaboration that has gone into this, to saying, I want to utilize my water rights to the best ability so that the next person downriver can use them as well. And the collaboration and the opportunities have become so much greater. And organizations like Colorado Water Trust 20 years ago were kind of a, sorry, but kind of a pariah. You didn't want to trust what that was happening out there. You didn't, you, they were going to take our water. And I don't hear those conversations as much, at least in the Yampa White Green Round Table area, that, no, let, what can we do to work together? How can we do better? How can we conserve? And how can we keep it here in Colorado so that we aren't sending it downstream for pecan farms? Let's, let's be realistic about we, what we can do in our valleys. One thing that I hear when ranchers and farmers get together increasingly is intensity. The intensity of weather patterns primarily, um, whether that's dry periods, whether it's wind in the winter, or even the intensity of precipitation as it's coming in you know, more concentrated doses, sometimes rain on snow, depleting snowpack earlier than would have been hoped. Um, and, and that has stimulated some, I think, really healthy questioning about how uh, land managers are moving forward. You know, how can they be more adaptable? And I think that exchange of ideas is one of the great things that's bringing food producers together. Um, I think the, the other thing that you know, I see is similar to what Marsh is saying, uh, more producers being interested in water conservation, um, open to that conversation when it used to bring quite a bit of hostility. Um, a few months ago, we had an event with conservation partners to exchange ideas. Um, you know, a lot of agencies and managers that don't get to work together necessarily, um, we hosted them at our ranch and uh, CWT was there and there was really something special that happened as we talked about some of the, you know, in-stream projects we've been working on and, you know, opening up that we are looking at, you know, water conservation tools uh, for, you know, our water rights. And some of our neighbors were invited, some came, I should say all of our neighbors were invited, uh, some came, and um, some of our oldest neighbors who, I would say we, we don't operate in the same way. And um, we have had maybe some contention around water in the past. Stayed to talk. They wanted to learn more. They wanted to learn more about CWT. They stayed, I think, for two hours 
after everyone else had left. And I just, you know, we have a water, a ditch company that has, I think, 12 different members. And of all those members, that was the last family that I would have expected to be interested in learning more. And um, it's really heartening um, to see communities come together. You know, we're working with scarce resources. Um, and I think that's, to me, what conservation is all about, recognizing that, you know, our natural resources are not endless. Though we do live in abundance here in North America, um, we must recognize that, you know, we can't just take, take, take. And so seeing communities come together around that concept, I think, is, is really the hope for the future as we work together instead of fight and we think about how we share instead of carve off our own portion. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the word intensity, and I wanted to add, if you don't mind, even though I'm the moderator, unpredictability mm -hmm. to that, which is, I think, something we've heard just in the last couple of years and really experienced. So at the Water Trust, we use water rights pursuant to agreements with the water right owners. And then the last couple of years, it's just been really surprising. Like this year, particularly, right? This huge, beautiful snowpack, a nice runoff. And then all of a sudden, in August, the bottom dropped out of a bunch of the rivers that we're working on. The Yampa, the Fraser, Tamichi Creek. Like it's, it's unpredictable. And I think it's really interesting. And our state does a good job, but I have a hard time wrapping my head around it sometimes, is the Colorado Water Plan. It's, it's planning. And so I'm adding this question because somebody provided a question and wanted to ha hear about the water plan a little bit more. So we want to bring that up tonight. So the water plan is a policy document that Governor Hickenlooper first put together eight years ago. Um, and it's, it's just like to summarize, like here's the water use we have in Colorado and here's where we see our water needs in Colorado. And it provides statistics and numbers about that. Like we're a growing state and here's how much water we need for our population. And we don't have a lot of environmental use and here's how much water we need for that. And we do have agricultural production, but we don't have enough water for that either. And so the Colorado Water Plan has a limited number of suggestions about how to get there, but it's really more just a documentation of what we have or what we kind of don't have. Um, so something that I really appreciate with our projects is water sharing. I feel like, right, if the sum of everything we need for agriculture plus municipal plus environmental plus industrial is 100 and we've only got 60 units of water, we have to stretch 60 units. Um, and we can do that by water sharing, but it's not easy. Um, anyway, I'm wondering from an agricultural perspective, are there conversations about sharing? Or what do you think about the water plan generally? I can just speak quickly just to reiterate. Um, you know, it hasn't been in the context of the water plan, but I, I do think that, you know, in our um, watershed, there is conversation around sharing and where we've actually approached very cautiously um, with concern that we may bring discord in opening up that conversation, we've been pleasantly surprised as, as folks are recognizing um, we're in it together and um, there is going to have to be compromise uh, for it to work for all of us. I'm going to offer a different perspective. Um, so on the Gunnison Basin Roundtable, we've prepared a basin implementation plan twice now to, and that's been a worthwhile exercise because it identify, you identify your needs in your basin. And it, uh, it, it takes a while to do, uh, but all the basins have done it. And so when they updated the water plan this last time around, we had to do our, uh, uh, the changes to our BIP, our basin implementation plan. And that really, I think, um, helped people realize how much work needed to be done just to maintain what we have. So that the, the existing agricultural infrastructure is old and it needs work. 
and and what the bi the benefit of the water plan process for us and the bip process was it identified those things so that uh, we had some idea of what our our infrastructure needs were um, but it, as to the the water sharing uh concept i i don't know i i uh think more about this i think about it differently and the focus is more i think on how these water rights are held by individuals. It's, I understand it's a use of right, but uh, these are water rights that people worked hard to develop and use and uh, put to beneficial use in our system according to the law and to try to defend those. And so the, the sharing, and we am involved in, um, in your program, there's a, there's a project in there on Tamichi Creek and that's, my, that's our place. And, and where, where sharing can work, um, at it, that's fine, but I wouldn't want to jeopardize the water right at any level. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I agree a lot with what she just said. Um, I don't know as much about that, but I think some of the things we need to do is we need to work on infrastructure. That's a huge part of it. We have, we in our watershed, we just got done fixing our reservoir, the dam on our reservoir, and we're now able to hold full capacity. That made a huge difference, but we really could use more storage capacity. Um, there's, we kind of have a feast or famine around here. We have years where we don't have nearly enough water, and then we have years where there's so much water that it's going, going down the creek, and if we could, could hold that for longer periods of time, hold more up high, and then allocate it more evenly over time in the years when it's dry, have some residual from the year before or a couple years before, and then in the wet years, bank that again back into those reservoirs. That'd be hugely beneficial for all of us. Um, as far as sharing goes, I mean, everybody has the right to do what they want to if it's their own water. So if they want to share their water, then great, let them share their water. If they can do that, if they, if they want to conserve their water using these practices, um, they, they absolutely can and should, and then they can share that water. It shouldn't be forced upon any of these ranchers, and it definitely shouldn't be taken from them. Um, so the water rights are, uh, are very important and need to stay intact in place for all these ranchers to survive. You said it beautifully. I have nothing to add. <laughs> okay. um, I want to ask an an ag production question um, and sort of find out like what what people should know about when it comes to agricultural operations and I think one a sort of a key term that we hear fairly frequently is regenerative agriculture and Sage and I'm curious you were talking a lot about your practices earlier and it sounds like maybe that's regenerative agriculture but I don't know and I'm wondering if you know what people hear about or see in documentaries, is that it? And is it is it the solution to everything? Because it, it sounds like some people think it is. <laughs> nothing is the solution to everything. There's no silver bullet, people. We can't, there's no, no one thing that's gonna fix all these problems. Um, regenerative agriculture has a lot of different definitions and I, it's sort of hard to pin down um, so I tried to I actually wrote this one down to the best way I could uh, farming and ranching in sync with nature um, but that what that means is increasing diversity productivity soil health plant health animal health human health and decreasing inputs so what you're trying to do with regenerative agriculture is you're trying to let the natural systems that have been evolving for millions of years take place, which took place for millions of years without human intervention. And you're trying to let those things, instead of fighting against nature, you're, you're letting nature's systems work in your favor. So for example, and I've, I've brought this up a couple times, but rotational grazing, the original, like the, the way that grass and animals co-evolved was that animals moved in big herds and high density herds across the plains across the grasslands 
they ate the grass, but then there was long rest periods and the grass had a long time to grow back. That built topsoil, we had, you know, 20 feet of topsoil in the Midwest. That's why it's such fertile and great growing, why it grew such great crops for so long, why it's the farming belt. Um, those systems worked on their own naturally. They, that, they was no human intervention and that when those systems were working, there was, you know, the, <coughs> the number of animals that were on, that were grazing those plains is rivals the amount of animals that were raising still in North America in factory farms, but it did it without humans intervening and the ecosystem was healthy for it. Those systems can be mimicked use, nowadays and those systems can be very effective and very affordable and productive. And so regenerative agriculture is is that is is trying to mimic those systems, mimicking natural systems, trying to do less work and try to get more production, and increasing the animals' health, the ecosystems' health, increasing diversity, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay, I had something I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I didn't know what the term meant, uh, but now I do. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I, I think we are doing regener regenerative agriculture on our place. And I know, like I said earlier, uh, everybody's a little different depending on where you are in the state and if you're a row crop farmer or if you're a forage producer. But uh, in, in the Upper Gunnison, so if, if ground is flood irrigated, so that's gravity flow. So we're not paying the electric company. To, we're not pumping any water putting that out, um, we don't have any, we don't use pesticides, we don't buy fertilizer, we use manure from the cattle because we feed them out on the meadows and then break that up every year. Uh, in fact, the extra manure from the corrals, we send in, uh, we sent out eight semi loads this past week down to the San Luis Valley for the organic potatoes down there. Um, and so that helped them and got rid of it for us, which is good. And, um, it, but I, it just occurs to me that this cycle might, maybe this is, and it's native grass hay, so we don't have to plant anything. And it, Gunnison's growing season is like a week long. So, <laughs> so we can't grow, it'd be really nice if we could grow lettuce or something, but so we so there's a reason the guys have all gone to native grass hay, but it maybe that is kind of regenerative. Yeah, actually, I was gonna I should throw a shot. I mean, most ranchers that are raising their cows on pasture and on, on are doing basically regenerative agriculture. They're growing perennial crops. They're doing raising for the most part. You know, it's it's fairly regenerative. There's you know levels of it, but but compared to like farming like corn. It's much more regenerative. We're not putting down acre, or, you know, tons of fertilizer and pesticides and all this. Perennial pastures are one of the most regenerative things out there. That's one, and cattle ranching and sheep ranching, raising animals on grasses is one of the most regenerative ag practices there are. Plus the carbon. Mm -hmm. Carbon sequestration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's perfect. I've really excited to talk about carbon sequestration through grazing practices. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware about the Climate Smart Commodities Program that the USDA has released. Uh, that started with $1 billion of incentives for North America's food producers to team up and propose projects to help develop standards for quantifying and monitoring carbon sequestration through these regenerative practices. Um, and this is super necessary. The science is not clear um, that, you know, adding that organic soil carbon is added, you know, through these practices. We can see that, you know, root zones are extended. That's a good sign. We can see that soil moisture content is improved. There's all these co-benefits. Um, but we obviously have this carbon game that we need to play. Um, and pretty exciting. Uh, that actually was increased to, I think, $3.2 billion in funding. Um, and uh, this is the future of our food systems, and it's really great to see our government stepping up um, and incentivizing producers in ways that they want to move forward. Um, and so, you know, I think 
when we think about carbon, we think about biodiversity, think about water. Um, these are all really critical steps that, um, you know, we can call it regenerative ag, but this is, you know, producing food in harmony um, and restoring the landscape. And uh, it is a critical step that we must embrace as a society. Okay, let's start with you then <laughs> for this next question. All right. Um, all right, Marcia, I just think this is a really good question. I'm wondering if there's, is there something that you wish that people who are not connected with agricultural in, Co in Colorado, which actually is hard to imagine, we all do eat food, um, but is there something that you wish generally that people who are not connected to agriculture in Colorado would understand about farmers and ranchers when it comes to agriculture's role in water conservation or otherwise? Oh, that's kind of like training somebody loose with an open mic, isn't it? Um, absolutely. I am so incredibly proud of our agricultural communities because number one, we're educated. We're not just out here being the old t stereotypical hillbillies not knowing what we're doing. We're paying attention to the, the environment. We're here because we love the ground, not because we're making a fortune off of this thing. It would be better if we could make a little bit more money, but it's a way, it's a lifestyle for us. And so for us to have the opportunity time after time to educate people. I honestly do not know how many groups over the years we have brought onto our ranch from little bitty guys up to senior citizens, from politicians to your common folk. Come out, we hold workshops, forums, uh, tours, whatever we can do to get people there. Um, picnics are always great, they like food, but, and gives us the opportunity to say to them, where would you be without agriculture? You'd be naked and hungry and thirsty. <laughs> Don't take it for granted because we are all working so hard to do it. You're in an area like we are where the development just keeps encroaching, encroaching, and encroaching on us. And sometimes I'm more fearful that development is going to be the falter, the failing point behind agriculture. Where water, there's so many people working on it. There's so many groups that are heading toward it but development is just encroaching all the time. So in a two minute time, that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, if I had uh, <clears throat> anything to add to that, it'd be just that ranchers are the hardest working people I know, and they're also some of the most clever, smartest people I know. They have to figure out how to make it work um, when situations are way less than favorable. Um, I mean, if you look at the business model of ranching and farming, it's the dumbest business model there is out there. It's like, here, let's throw every variable we can in there, and we're not going to, the prices are not going to be nearly enough to make it worth your while, and you're going to work 80, 90 hours a week. Um, to be, be able to make it happen. So most ranchers are extremely frugal. They work insane hours. They don't get days off. And when a calf gets out or something gets out and it's 10 o'clock at night, you don't get to just say, well, I'll take care of it in the morning. You got to get out there and you got to go take care of it. <clears throat> um, and water is the livelihood of ranchers. So ranchers lose sleep over water. We don't think about water. It's in our, it's in our bones. It's 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 the most important thing to us. You know, most people don't even think about water. They turn their water on the tap. They they get annoyed that it's raining on the day that they're going to go take a hike or a bicycle ride, or they're worried about the snowpack because they want to come skiing. We're worried about losing our livelihood. So, uh, yeah, ranchers they put their all into it, and water is the lifeblood of ranchers. So just to add to that, uh, I guess, two, two thoughts. Um, one would be that it, it's a business and it has to pencil out. Uh, so if, like I gave the example of sprinklers earlier not working real well 
for native grass hay. And the point being there that you have one cutting, and if you have a really a $40,000 a month electric bill, um, which is what they pay in San Luis Valley, um, that doesn't pencil out. So, it, you know, it's a business and it has to, it has to work. And um, I want to give a little pitch for the cattle industry because there's a, there's a, a, a lot of folks that I think get concerned about cattle and public lands and cattle in general. But uh, every time I think about it, I think about how if the cattle industry isn't doing well in the U.S., then we bring in more Brazilian cattle and we bring in more beef from Canada, and, but mainly Brazil. And, and if we're doing that and they don't have the same standards for health, for vaccinations, and um, it, then, you know, I don't know that everybody wants to see that really, but that's what happens. You, if you drive cow-calf producers out of business, if um, small feedlots can't make it, for whatever reason, and you see the business starting to decline, then we'll get, the people are, aren't gonna stop eating beef. They're gonna bring it in from another country and it won't be, uh, the animals won't be treated as well. And the landscapes probably aren't gonna be treated as well either, right? We know that encroachment and the Amazon Atlantic force is primarily driven by beef and soy. And what is that soy being used for? And, and palm oil over the world. Uh, avoid palm oil if you can. Unfortunately, it's not really our decision making that changes the palm story, story in southern countries. Um, when I think about what I would want others to know about ranchers and farmers, um, you know, is think of them not as hillbillies. Um, think of not of them as, you know, just business people. Think of them as land stewards. You know, where have humans gone to grow and produce food? Some of the richest landscapes across our country. They are managing these areas. They are providing habitat for wildlife. They are supporting water catchments. And these are critical services that you would have to pay someone an extreme amount to do, right? And these individuals are suffering through it, not being rewarded by the market um, because they're passionate and they're caring. And I think one of the things that's most important um, is that we recognize that food producers are the backbone of our communities. And it's important to build a relationship. Okay, Local is, is really an important consideration um, because it reduces costs. Um, it reduces costs from a financial standpoint, it reduces costs from an emission standpoint, um, and you're really investing in your local landscape when you're buying local produce. Um, and you are um, investing in your community, and that builds resiliency. And I think, again, I think I've used that word a couple times, that's really critical at this day and stage. Thanks, I'd like to touch base with you guys out here for a second, because we've got some more really good questions that I wanna ask, but I wanna prioritize. Just give me a little indication if you're gonna ask questions, because I think we're going to and have a really good discussion, but I wanna plan it out and provide space. Okay, and I hope you do. I hope you take that as encouragement, because we wanna have the conversation and get you the information from the panel that you want. Um, so just a couple more questions for the panel then. Um, and Kathleen, are you okay if we start with you again? <laughs> um, what do you see as the future of agriculture in our rivers in the West? And do you see an appropriate role for government in that future? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I know. <laughs> I wish I could say that I thought the future for agriculture was bright, but I, I don't really feel that way, honestly. You know, this is an honest discussion. So I uh, have the next generation coming up, like guys your age um, are trying. Uh, but it's, you know, you've all heard about the economics and they can't afford the land and they can't afford to buy out their siblings that might want to sell when the, when the 
uh, next generation leaves it to them. And so I think the economics are really rough. I think uh, there's a perception that har uh, challenges are coming at them from a whole lot of different directions, whether it's species related or um, the price of cattle or the price of inputs or water shortages. So I don't actually have, um, I think some, you'll continue to see some agriculture, but I think the development pressures in uh, our area are having a huge impact on whether ranches stay in the families or not. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a, I'm sorry to talk so long. You want me to hush up? Okay. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's a 10,000 acre place owned by the guy who owns the, uh, used to own the Texas Rangers and is that right? Baseball team. I don't know what he owned. Something. He has a lot of money. 10,000 acres, uh, you know, heritage ranch. And he sold it. His kids, it's not under easement. Um, our place is under easement. But he sold it to a, a guy who doesn't want to keep the cattle on there and let the ranch manager go. And um, they were called ecosystem investments out of Florida. And they put all the homestead houses on the market for sale, little log home for $1.6 million. It's ridiculous. And so that ranch is toast. That's gone. The, the elk will be the only ones eating the grass there now. And, th and that's what's happening in our valley. Uh, and is there are not as many family-owned ranches. There's outside investors. Some of them like to keep it in ag, some don't. And or their kids might not want to. So I, I, I feel like it's, um, I wish it was better. But then as far as the role of the government goes, I actually am not one of these people that runs around and says how terrible the government is. I, I, I don't see a lot of use in that. I uh, think, think that the government's been there for us when we needed to make sure that our water rights were protected. The, the government is the entity paying for the water courts. They're the ones that are making sure that the that our water rights, when they're in priority, that we can call. And so I see them as a partner. Um, and and I, the state engineer's office has always done everything they could to help us. Uh, the water commissioners have leaned over backwards to help us. So I don't have a real bad uh, feeling about the role of, of government in the future, but I'm sure there's probably other points of view. <laughs> Um, well, I have a little more optimistic viewpoint, but maybe it's because I'm young, young and dumb, <laughs> uh, ignorant. Um, so I have a lot of friends my age that are in agriculture and, and a lot of them be, that are very successful. So that's positive. And I've met a lot of people. I go to a lot of conferences. I just was down in Georgia this spring at a grazing conference and most of that uh, was young people um, getting into agriculture who are either taking over for their families or just getting into it and wanting to learn more. Um, and, and you know, it's a good thing. Young people getting into it means that they're going to bring innovation. They're also going to make lots of mistakes, just like everybody. But they're, they ha they're, they're thinking outside the box. They're bringing innovation, and that's good. So I, I am hopeful for that aspect of it. Um, and I think with change comes... and is opportunity so um, and change sparks innovation so the young people have to be innovative with everything that is changing with the changing climate that we have um, with the changing water situations laws everything we we have to change with it uh, we have to be innovative to keep up so i, I am positive in that way um, and then as far as government goes, it kind of depends on who's in charge and who's making the decisions. I think government is supposed to be there to protect the people. That's the role of government. Um, that's what laws are for. That's what the idea of government is. Unfortunately, oftentimes government protects pr the special interest groups uh, and the people with money and power. Um, so it very much depends on who is making those decisions in the government. But the government's role, I think, could be positive. Uh, one of the things I think that would be positive to see is, is 
money allocated to smaller farmers. I mean, if you look at the farm bill, a lot, incredible amounts of money are allocated to farming corn and soy and wheat and doing all of these farming practices. And that includes paying farmers not to grow <laughs> their crops so that they can stabilize the price. There's massive subsidies going to farming practices to just control prices and to grow a certain way and it, and it kind of confines the industry. If that money was reallocated to smaller farms, um, independent farms and innovative farming practices, I think it could be really beneficial. But again, it depends on who's in charge in the government. I also am a little more optimistic. Um, I, I feel that farming, well, people are always going to have to eat. They're going to have to drink, and they're going to want their beer. So therefore, and, and goodness knows we all want to wear clothing. So we've got, we're going to have agriculture. Um, it's not going to be the same as my grandfather's operation. It's not going to be the same as my dad's operation. Thank goodness my, my kids are doing things differently than my husband and I chose to do them. And I think if the next generation steps up, they're going to have to use those innovative ways as well to maintain, to produce more food on less ground with less water. But I think they'll do it. I think they can do it. Yes, government does have a role. And Colorado water rights is a prime example of this. Had we not had the water rights system in Colorado that we do, private ownership would not have those water rights. And goodness sakes, I don't think that we want the, uh, our politicians to have those water rights and try to decide what to do with it. So the laws that are there are there for a purpose, and they've been upheld by the courts, and they've been upheld by the different entities. And then organizations like Colorado Water Trust have come in and allowed those water rights to be used to a beneficial and perhaps a, an innovative way. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm more positive. Agriculture is going to succeed. We'll never make a fortune off of it, I don't think. I'm sorry, Sajin, but I think that uh, there's, there's a lot of benefit there for your family and your lifestyle, regardless of the dollar sign. Another nice thread to pick up. Um, in regards to the future of agriculture and, and rivers in the West, uh, the government that we need is a government that's willing to change systems that aren't working in our favor. Um, we've heard, I think, a number of times about, you know, Sanjay was just talking about the perverse incentives that are destroying our food systems and our landscapes and our communities, uh, human health. Um, as a result of subsidizing um, and incentivizing poor practices um, that, you know, aren't necessary. Um, but there are special interests that are being favored. Um, there are, when systems change, um, they're suffering from those who maybe aren't favored in those new systems, and that's hard. Um, but if we look at what we really need, we need food, we need fuel, we need fiber, um, we need those ecosystem services that land stewards are managing and provisioning and ensuring can be there for the future. And we can see it. Um, you know, there is interest from the government to incentivize that good work to reward um, land stewards through carbon markets, uh, as we just talked about, uh, through water conservation funding, um, even biodiversity. Um, Wyoming just passed with the NRCS uh, habitat leasing program to support land managers who are improving biodiversity and managing those habitats. Like, these kind of incentives will help fill the gaps that the market is not addressing right now. Um, and then it's also up to consumers to change their behavior and uh, making sure that they're buying high quality uh, local produce rather than what's just cheapest or um, what's most convenient. And, and that's hard too, right? It's, it can be expensive, but that's a short-term cost. Uh, the long-term costs are, are much more significant and uh, that, is, that is what we need. And um, I have hope, um, but these are big systems to change and um, that's, a, 
that's going to be a generational effort. All right. Um, Rob, I'll hand it right back to you to kick this one off, if you don't mind. I would no. really love to hear from everybody on this. So the question would be, what is the call to action? Like, particularly for people in the room and their friends and family who aren't agricultural producers, what do you want them to take away? And what should they do? Start reading more about food systems. Um, there's some really terrible stuff out there on the internet, of course, but there's some amazing books and uh, documentaries um, that are really compelling. Um, question what you're, you know, ingesting in terms of information. Uh, and then talk to your friends and family um, about what you're learning and, and start that discourse and then advocate, right, for yourselves, uh, for your local food producers, talk to your representatives. Um, you know, this, these systems change um, efforts really do require active engagement. I think we can be very passive as we're all so busy um, in our daily lives, but um, this, is, this is meaningful and it's necessary. So um, research, question, discuss, um, and advocate. Those would be my recommendations. Every time that we have a group out on our place, I always finish it out by saying, please, please, please don't sign your name to a petition if you don't know what it's about. We've seen it time after time how it affects agriculture. Kathleen's made reference to the wolves. There's, a, there's an underground movement here that we've got to do away with private water rights. And if that ever goes to the ballot, we will lose it for agriculture, I feel. But please, before you sign your name to any type of petition, whether it's on water, it's on wildlife management, do your research and call some folks that are in agriculture and ask them what direct impact it will have on, on them and their operation. And if it's going to be harmful to them, please don't sign that petition at the post office just because they've asked you to. Yeah, it's harder to say it any better than that. I, that's, I agree 100%. I was going to say, basically say, I was going to say, know your farmer. Uh, that's a movement that we've been pushing for. I feel like everybody should know where their food comes from. You should go out. You should walk around on the farm. You should see how, uh, how they're doing their practices um, and talk to them because uh, the ranchers understand the land management and water and all these systems better than anybody else. Um, and you could learn a lot and it, and that you may not agree with them a hundred percent. That's okay. It's, <laughs> we don't have all the answers. That's for sure. But, um, but at least under go out there and meet your farmers, know where your food comes from, understand how much work it takes, understand what the, uh, they're dealing with and the struggles they have put on their plates, um, before you make decisions that affect their lives. So I don't want to sound like, I'm lecturing, so this is a hard question for me. Um, on on the positive side, I think that getting educated is a great thing. Um, we haven't even talked about recreation here tonight, and that's a big factor for the folks that are in areas where there's recreational demand. And, and I heard a great story recently. Uh, uh, there's a gal who's a range rider up by Crested Butte, and she felt like when she could actually talk to the folks on their bikes and once they understood uh, what what was so harmful if a gate was left open or if um, it, how to how to ride through cattle uh, and just some basic stuff and when they had a when they were just able to talk about it um, she said boy they were more than happy to try to try to figure it out a way for us to coexist so that's um, just a positive. Thank you all so much. You are amazing individuals, amazing Coloradans. Really appreciate it. I learn from you every time I see you. And we're going to turn it over to questions. Um, but first, if we could give a round of applause. Yeah.
what the ranchers around you are saying about it. Because it seems like the upper watershed ranch, the ranches and the farmland are important for maintaining and protecting the water as a resource for the whole watershed. Do there, what do the ranchers say about their <laughs> needs? Do there need to be rules to protect um, ranch land to keep it active, ranch mm -hmm. land? Or what do they say? Uh, well, they're really bummed because the head gate for the main canal that's nine miles long, runs at 150 CFS, is on that ranch. And the, and the new owners are super grumpy. They put up three new gates. Nobody has the combination. We can't get to the diversion head gate. So, so there, there's a frustration um, from that point of view, but there's a respect for that landowner who he did what he wanted to do. That's how he wanted to handle his private property, and it's not our place to judge that um, and, and say anything about that. He has had every op opportunity to put land under conservation easement if he wanted to. We have an active conservation easement um, program in our county, thousands of acres under easement. So he could have done that. that you got to be under a rock to not know that's available, you know. And it... <laughs> And he chose not to, so it's not for us to say, but what we need to do, those of us who rely on that ditch, we got to um, meet the new owners, uh, try to build a relationship with them, and, and figure out the combination to those gates. <laughs> Do you want me to start on that? Yeah. Um, so yeah, in the Grand Valley, uh, I work at the Capitol Building and I represent Grand, the Grand Valley Water Users Association. And there are uh, entities in the Grand Valley that have um, no, there's no prohibition, there's no um, litmus test for who you can sell your water to. The issue is whether you can take water off the ground. So if they if they aren't farming it, or and if it's you know private company versus water users association, so there's all that stuff happening. Uh, but it's really yeah, it is really controversial, and uh, the water users don't. Again, they're in a position of saying, well, is it my place to say that my neighbor can't sell to that guy because that guy is from a foreign country? They're, they're really struggling with that. Um, where the rubber hits the road, though, is if, that, if the buyer, whoever they are, takes land out of production and then injures a neighbor because they can't get the water down the ditch or whatever, then, then you can have a real bona fide conversation, I think, about it. But, but yeah, this speculation issue is so tricky. I mean, I'm just wondering, you, you've all talked about, you know, your practices and how, you know, they, they work for, for, uh, you know, for agriculture locally. And I'm wondering if there's any effect on um, some of those practices. Not yet, but it could happen, I think. It's, it's happening not only with foreign purchasers, but during the pandemic, our valley saw a great number of people trying to get out of the cities with big money and came in and bought ranches, literally, that weren't even for sale, knocked on people's doors and said, yeah, uh, well, can we buy this? And land is turned over greatly. Um, and the trouble becomes, because those people are used to dealing with lawyers, rather than coming out and meeting their neighbors and saying, how do things work here? The next thing we know, we're getting letters from our lawyers and or from their lawyers to tell us how we should be doing things. And uh, the education factor is so hard because they're not even on site. It's all being done with uh, maybe a manager that they've hired from wherever they came from and brought up to, to a high country altitude. And the poor kid is stuck. I mean, it's, it's a bad, it's, we feel badly for him. But that's how we're having to operate now. We don't talk to each other over a pickup bed. We're talking to each other with lawyers. And that's a hell of an expense for all of us now, too, that we did not have before. 
I don't know a whole lot about that. It's just I know that that's obviously an issue with private ownership. That is one of the downsides is that people have the freedom to do what they want with their private ownership. So if they own private water, they can sell that water. Um, if they own private land, they can sell that land. They can do whatever they want with it within reason. Um, we want to keep our private water. We've been talking about that all night. <clears throat> what we do about keeping that water on the land, <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that. I, I would love to talk to people that are more knowledgeable than me about that, but it is a problem. There are people who are buying land that have lots of money that want to develop it and they don't need the water, so they sell the water off or uh, whatever, and um, <clears throat> it's detrimental to all of us. Kind of a new kid on the block kind of question, but um, I wonder if anybody feels comfortable addressing solar farms, which has suddenly become a pretty contentious issue in our immediate area. There's a plan for it to take 600 acres and <coughs> solar panels. They're saying that they don't need any water to do this. And in fact, the land that they propose <coughs> to put the solar panels on has no water rights. The girly ditch runs through it, but they don't have the right to tap it. But they're saying they don't need water. But the research that has come to light says, well, you have to wash these panels periodically, or they get so dusty that they don't reflect. <coughs> and they're proposing that you can plant uh, feed crops under the solar panels and ranchers can continue to graze under the solar panels on this new stuff. Um, if in fact it doesn't use water, then my question is not appropriate for this group, but we have reason to believe that maybe water is an issue and is this one more new kid on the block who's going to be competing with scarce water resources. Anybody have any experience with that? I don't have any experience but if, if I, with that, but I would hire a lawyer and claim that that's not a, that's not a recognized beneficial use. Yeah. But on the other hand, the on the other hand, yeah, there's, a, I mean, it's, it's a good thing if that's not productive land, maybe that's, a, I don't know, you know, maybe there's places where that does make sense, but, oh, yeah. um, I'm not sure, sure about the details there. Anybody want to bail me out? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's my neck of the woods. We've been pretty upset about it. Um, it's, I don't even know what to say about it. It's, uh, nobody is in favor of it in our town that I know of. I haven't talked to a single person that's in favor of it. And the reason that nobody's in favor of it isn't because everybody's against solar or anything like that is because it's huge, it's massive. Like she said, 600 acres, I think it's a thousand acres that they're, of land that they're purchasing with 600 acres in uh, put, put into solar production. It's gonna be a massive um, it, eyesore. Yeah, that's the only way to put it. I mean, it, imagine, it, for anybody here in Telluride who thinks that we're just not green or something, imagine them putting 600 acres of solar on your valley floor. That's what it is to us in Norwood. And it's an amazing, beautiful ecosystem. It has the ditch running through it. It's, uh, <clears throat> and the idea that they're gonna graze some animals underneath it without water in Norwood is ridiculous. There's, how, how are we gonna graze? There's no water on it now, and the only reason that it isn't just a dust bowl out there is because it has sagebrush and pinion juniper and um, you know native hardy species that are drought tolerant that are holding the soil there. How, you're gonna keep sagebrush underneath the <laughs> these solar panels? I don't think so. Um, it's it's not thought out and and I think they came in and it was done um, very secretively. This is the problem that most of us have with it also is it seems like actually they're talking about private land ownership and the kind of stuff with water. It, I don't know the all the details and the facts but it appears that uh, private landowner came in and bought a piece of that land um, from out of state and for the use of put or for the reason of putting solar panels on it to be able to get a 
adjacent chunk of land. So there you go. There's a private landowner selling their land to some other interest so that they can put solar panels on it. Anyways, um, that's a whole nother can of worms and another conversation to have, but nobody in Norwood's for it, whether or not you're for solar. Yeah, so full disclosure, our family are, are adjacent landowners and are many other families. This is not in an obscure, isolated area. This is right in the middle of a very vibrant center of, of an agricultural community. Yeah, with houses all around it. Houses yeah. like yeah. it's fairly yeah. opposite. Um, one thing I wanted to add real quickly is our state is pretty amazing when it comes to water rights and our water court system. And it's a really fascinating private property system that works very well for allocation of water rights. Our division of water resources is incredibly good at not allowing unadjudicated uses of water. And something that this private property system facilitates, a lot like land conservation and land easements, conservation easements, agricultural easements, is a facilitation of conversations among people who are interested in using those water rights. Uh, just like tonight, and I just want to express the appreciation for this conversation and I am so appreciative that we, it brings together people from different economic perspectives and backgrounds and parts of our state to compare what's going on and have conversations about how we work together. And water is so vital to the future of our state and what it looks like and how we succeed as a people together. So really appreciate this conversation. I think to yes. I'll just bring in a perspective that I, I haven't heard and it's I will channel my daughter who's vegan and who says that you know beef uses 10 times the water uh, per unit of protein that soy does that cattle are a major contributor to climate change from their methane emissions and so I guess I would just ask um, the panelists, do you think Americans should eat less beef? Uh, it's like the last ski run. You should never do it. Wholeheartedly, yes. Uh, but as a, as a scientist, one of the things I get frustrated with is labeling beef as, as beef. Beef is not produced the same across this country, across the globe. And so that comes back to being a very discerning consumer. Um, and then we also have to recognize the variety of landscapes that we have. We can't grow soy everywhere, right? There are arable lands that we can plant row crops and there's areas that we should not be putting any disking or tilling equipment in at all. Um, I like to think about cattle as a tool um, for management. Okay? They're replicating what ungulates have done for millions of years in places that we just don't have those wildlife populations anymore. Um, they're actually a pretty efficient tool for converting um, plant material into protein. Um, and so we need to do a better job of being efficient and utilizing that tool wisely. Um, and then as consumers, we do need to reduce our um, animal protein consumption, our protein consumption in general. Um, there's one thing that I was thinking about um, that I think we all can get behind, vegans and carnivores alike, is food waste. Okay, maybe that's really where we should be picking our battles, not what you eat, um, but not consuming too much and and not leaving um, something for the landfill right there is such a drastic problem with food waste in this country and across the globe i think something like one third of all food goes to waste um, that's like a, a trillion dollars a year and i think it's close to 10 percent of our carbon emissions are, are due to production of food that just isn't even consumed um, so 
I, I think that we, we do need to be thoughtful about where we're raising food, what practices we're using, um, what we're consuming, but um, how much we're consuming is, is really important and uh, not letting that go to waste is, is something that I think um, we should all think about as we walk out this door and head to dinner tonight uh, and go to the grocery store tomorrow. So um, on behalf of the, my, the fifth generation on our grass-fed beef operation, no. <laughs> Uh, I could talk about this subject for hours, and if you want to afterwards, I will. There's so much information out there to go with it um, that I definitely can't pack it into three minutes here. But the idea that cow farts is the cause of climate change and that's what we need to regulate is ridiculous. I mean, humans fart too. We should get rid of more humans, probably, <laughs> is one of my solutions. But let's just take that out of the picture, all of that. <clears throat> the idea that raising soy is more sustainable than raising cows is absolutely ridiculous. It does depend on how the animals raise. Now, the way that we do it primarily, raising them in feedlots, yeah, we're feeding them corn and soy and all those things. So it's massively carbon intensive and it uses a lot of diesel and all that. If we were to mimic nature, like what I was talking about earlier, and using something that's sustainable and regenerative, no, it's it's mimicking nature. Nature went on for millions of years with more undulants on this planet than there are now. They, I mean, think about what the North America would have looked like with, but before it was settled. We had millions, tens of millions of bison, elk, deer, antelope. Grizzly bears, all the, the, the amount of animals that were on the planet and the climate wasn't warm enough, we weren't adding methane at high rates. And the reason is because there's a methane and carbon cycle. It's a cycle, it has to be, and what puts carbon back into the ground is perennial grasses. So if you grow per, perennial grasses, that sequesters carbon dioxide back into the ground, same with per, trees and all these things. That is the solution to, or a big part of the solution to getting stopping or reducing carbon dioxide is the probably the most efficient solution to carbon dioxide is raising perennial field pastures and the only way to keep those pastures going without fertilizing them with synthetic fertilizers is with animals if they are symbiotic and if you think about just real quick what the process is to raise a soy for example soybeans you have a tractor that has to go out and till the field and level the field and then they got to plant the field and then they got to spray the field and then they got to if you're doing it the traditional way that they've been doing it and then you got to spray the field then you got to fertilize the field and then you got to cultivate the field and then you got to ship it around the country to all these people to make a soy burger my my cow is in my field it never leaves my field or you know the mesa i run it around you know maybe with my four-wheeler but a lot of it i do on foot sometimes by, with horses. If I wanted to do it with zero carbon emissions, I could. could. I could walk them around on foot. I could walk, run, move around the, the mesa on a, hor a horseback, and I could kill them in my backyard and never burn a single gallon of fuel. You can't do that with soybeans anywhere. And it, soy is water intensive. Perennial grasses take very little water. Perennial grasses have grown in the desert on you know, eight inches of water annually. The grasses grow everywhere, everywhere on the planet. There's a lot more I could say about it. <laughs> I second what Kathleen said, of course. Um, if we do away with all cattle and sheep operations in the United States, those ranchers will be forced to sell their ground. I mean, that's their, that's their retirement fund. Um, and pavement is our last great crop. Actually, let me add one more. Sorry. It's so, so good. And I apologize. I got to say one more thing real fast. The idea that veganism and vegetarianism also is more humane is also not thought out. And here's why it's people that aren't in touch with nature. Animals don't die happy deaths in nature, they don't fall asleep and have a heart attack or in their sleep. They die from starvation, they die from being old, and they die from being ripped to death by predators. 
at least as humans, we kill them quickly and efficiently. And as they're being raised humanely and they're killed quickly and efficiently, it's the most humane death and the least amount of suffering that an animal can have. And ranchers and farmers who love, who care about their animals are doing everything they can to make sure their animals are, are suffering in any way. If they are, if they, animal is sick, they give them antibiotics or whatever they need to do to help them, you know, recover. If they're having trouble calving, we pull their calves. If they were in nature having trouble calving, they're going to die. And then they're going to get eaten by predators if, they, if they're crippled. That's, how, that's the death of an animal in nature, is to be eaten by a predator or to die from starvation. That's a pretty bad way to go. Thank you. <laughs> no more questions. <laughs> All right, uh, on behalf of the Telluride Foundation and the Colorado Water Trust, we are very grateful for you showing up tonight, being a part of this community conversation. The topic is near and dear to us as an organization, us as individuals. I think, Marcia, you said it best, concrete doesn't grow a damn thing, it doesn't sequester any carbon, it doesn't produce any benefit to our society. Protecting farm and ranches is at our core. Protecting the water rights and the water resources is at the core of that. We are very grateful for our panelists tonight, each and every one of you. Thank you for making the time. All right, if you want to stick around, our panelists are hanging out.